So I'm um, going to jump a little bit ahead here. We're going to have some class time to work on acceleration today and like all of tomorrow's class. Uh, but I will be away tomorrow afternoon and we get a short class tomorrow because of the uh, Ash Wednesday service. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go over a bit of projectile motion today uh, so, they'll, uh, so that tomorrow you can just work on acceleration stuff. But I want to introduce this. This is the last topic okay, in this unit, right, with projectile motion. So if you can find that in your note package, it's lesson 14, you can follow along here. Okay. The definition of a projectile is any object in unpowered flight okay, that is essentially caught in the Earth's gravitational field. Right? We say within the Earth's atmosphere, but it would include basically anywhere where something could fall to Earth. Right? Um, a meteor would be considered a projectile. It's not in powered flight. Okay? It's, uh, a bird is not a projectile because a bird is in powered flight. Okay? Neither is a missile or an airplane. But a bomb would be because it's not powered, it's just dropped. Okay? A bullet would be a projectile, it's not powered. Once it's launched from the rifle or fired from the rifle, it is in unpowered flight. Throwing a ball, playing catch, a frisbee even. Okay? Um, you know, all of that stuff, those are all projectiles. Okay? And we have a really good understanding, just kind of intuitively, of how projectile motion works, because we throw stuff all the time. Okay? Or we you know, see things that, uh, that go through unpowered flight through the air. Um, maybe when you were a kid, you might have played with the hose you know, out in the backyard or something like that. And if your little brother or sister was too far away and you couldn't get them, all you had to do was like, point the nozzle upwards a little bit and the water traveled farther. Right? That's all projectile motion. If you change the angle, it's going to be in the air for longer, which means it'll have the chance to travel farther. Right? So you aim a little higher, it goes a little bit further. So you get to 45 degrees and that starts coming back at you. You should never point straight up in the air unless you're looking to cool off. Right? So um, projectiles, anything in un unpowered flight in the Earth's gravitational field. Okay? It has two dimensions to its motion, and they're happening at the same time. So in that way, projectile motion is a lot like a boat question that we would have done back in the vectors part. The object is moving in, a vertical, um, in the vertical plane as well as the horizontal plane. What's different about projectiles from boats is that the boat questions involve a constant velocity in both uh, dimensions, in both across and downstream. There's a constant velocity. For a projectile, the horizontal part of its motion is a constant velocity, but the vertical part of its motion is affected by gravity, and as a result is showing accelerated motion. Okay, so the vertical part is accelerated and the horizontal part is uh, a constant velocity. Now, we do simplify this a little bit. Okay? We are looking at this in the perfect physical world where air resistance plays no factor. Okay? Air resistance has a big effect on projectiles as they travel through the Earth's atmosphere. Okay? They would travel a lot differently were it not for air resistance. Okay? Um, so, that covers the key points. Questions so far? Okay. So, what goes up must come down. Okay, we've all experienced that. If that were not the case, I could throw something in the air and it would go forever and not come back. Okay? Um, it's actually kind of funny when you see astronauts who've been on the International Space Station for like six to eight or nine months. When they come back, they're used to not having things fall. Okay, I remember watching Chris Hetfield. He came back and he was doing an interview and uh, the guy asked him for an autograph and he was writing it and then he went like this. Because he was used to just letting go of the pen having it sit there. And then he oh, go back and get it. And you could see as soon as he did it, he's just like, he just he felt like, and this is a highly intelligent man. I mean, he just felt really stupid over what he had just done. Okay? That he'd let go of this thing and it'd just fall. Okay? But the simplest projectile is a falling object. When you drop it, it falls. Now that only has one dimension to the motion because it's not moving. Yeah, it's not moving horizontally, right? If I just drop it, it just goes vertically, okay? The next simplest projectile would be something I throw straight up in the air, okay? It, well, that one moved horizontally because I didn't throw it straight up in the air, okay? But if I threw it straight up in the air, it comes straight back down, okay? That's still a projectile. Everybody follow me on those? Okay, so it goes up, it comes back down, it's affected by gravity, it's a projectile. Now, if I decided that somebody was making me angry and I was going to throw this at them, okay, then that would have both a vertical and a horizontal component. Okay? Now, if I wanted to throw this a long way, 
okay? So somebody at the back of the room. I don't aim for them. Where do I aim? A little bit above them, right? Because I have to take into account that this thing is going to drop a little bit on its way towards them, right? And so I've got to correct for that. If I don't, it's just going to hit the floor, okay? You probably had that happen in a snowball fight. Right? You, you don't correct for the drop and the snowball lands like in front of the person and they laugh at you while throwing a big one at your face. Okay? All right, so um, I know that happens with my kids all the time. I laugh at them. They're like, hey, and it, it just falls in front of me and then chase them. Okay? Um, so you have to correct for this. You have to correct for the fact that, yes, an object is going to travel in two dimensions. Horizontally, not much affected. And for our purposes, we're ignoring air resistance. Nothing affects the horizontal part of the motion. It travels at a constant velocity horizontally. So even if I throw it at an angle up into the air, the horizontal part of that is constant. Okay? But yes, certainly it goes up and down. If I was looking at it from two different dimensions, I would see an object going horizontally. Now I'd see an object doing this. Okay? All projectiles, that's all they do. If they're thrown at an angle, they go up, they come back down. Okay? And that's it. Okay? Horizontally, they just go like this. Now, we're probably not going to get to looking at like angled projectiles today, but we'll look at fairly simple ones like stuff where, let's say, you ran off the 10 meter diving platform. Okay? You don't jump up at all, you just run horizontally off of it. Okay? Well, then you just fall. Okay. All right. Um, so, obviously, that means an object fired horizontally will have the same flight time as an object that's dropped. Is that true? Let me ask it a different way. I have two bullets. One bullet is in my hand. The other bullet is in a gun not pointed at anyone. Okay? I pull the trigger and drop the bullet at exactly the same time. Which one hits the ground first? Same time. Same time. That's one people have a hard time wrapping their heads around. Okay? But the two bullets were the same distance from the ground. The fact that one's moving horizontally and the other doesn't, doesn't affect how far, how far they have to fall or how long it will take them to do that. They both have to fall the same distance under the influence of gravity. They will both hit the ground at the same time. Okay? Strange, but true. Okay? The fact that you're moving horizontally doesn't change the effect that gravity has on you. All right. Now, uh, yesterday, we were talking about, uh, we had that question with the bullet exiting the barrel of the gun, and bullets are really good examples of the first type of projectile motion we're going to talk about. Something launched horizontally. Okay? They just fall. Okay? So if you're firing a bullet, okay, you, if you fire it straight, it just does this. Okay? And curves down to the ground. And same if you throw a ball or any other object horizontally, it just goes down in an arc projectile arc to the ground. Okay. So if I want to hit a target, I have to aim above it slightly, as we were talking about people. Okay. The further away that target is, the more I have to correct for the drop. Okay. Does that follow so far? Okay. So yesterday we were talking about those longest sniper shots. Out of morbid curiosity, I looked them up. Um, of the top five longest sniper shots, three are Canadian. Proud of, I guess, because okay. that's pretty cool. Okay. Um, yeah, so three of the longest shots, and the longest shot is 725 meters longer than the second place shot. That's great. Okay. It makes you almost feel like it's a little fluke. I would never say that to the guy who made it. All right, um, so is everyone kind of following how this works? Okay, so this, the simplest projectile is just a dropped object. Second, second simplest, thrown straight up in the air. Okay? And then the third simplest would be the thing we're going to look at, which is an object that um, is launched horizontally. Okay, so let's say we've got this situation here. So let's say this person is doing like, I don't know if you've seen some of those GoPro videos, like where the person like just runs off a cliff. And it looks like they're going to crash into the ground, and then at the last minute they hit the water. So live one of those where nobody gets hurt. Okay. So this person is going to run off this cliff horizontally off the cliff at let's say a good clip, 15 meters per second. The cliff 
is, let's say, 80 meters. That seems like a lot, but let's say that, 80 meters tall. Um, how far from the base of the cliff will they hit the water? projectile motion problem. I have to look at this from the two planes in which the motion is happening. Because they only have one thing in common, just like the boat questions. The one thing in common that they have is time. Okay? The person will be moving vertically and horizontally for the same amount of time. Because once they hit the water, they're no longer doing either one. Okay? Same as when we get across the river, we're not, we're not going across or down anymore. Okay? So they're the time is the only thing they share. So what I want to do is break the question up into vertical and horizontal components. And so essentially I need to write down my givens from two different perspectives. What do I know from a vertical perspective that applies to this question? That they will fall 80 meters. That they will fall 80 meters. What else do I have? I know two more things vertically. Hmm? Exactly. I know the acceleration. I know one other thing. This person ran horizontally off the cliff. How fast were they moving vertically at time zero? Right, okay. They weren't moving vertically at time zero, they were moving horizontally. So their initial vertical velocity is zero. All right, so I know three pieces of information about the vertical part of this movement. From a horizontal perspective, I know one thing. Well, I don't know that. I know this. I know they're moving at 15 meters per second. And that's not going to change. Okay? They're going to move at 15 meters per second horizontally the entire time. Does that mean that like, their overall velocity doesn't change? Absolutely not. Okay? They are going to go faster and faster vertically. But they're not going to go faster and faster horizontally. And that's in incidentally why when you see a car go off a cliff in a movie okay, or something like that, it looks like it's initially all horizontal and then it looks like they're only moving straight down. It's because initially they really are only moving horizontally. But because vertically speaking they're accelerating and going faster and faster, the vertical part of their movement becomes the dominant part very quickly. Okay. You mean you're accelerating at 9.81 meters per second squared in a vertical downward direction. You're going a lot faster vertically than you are horizontally pretty fast. Okay. Does everyone kind of follow me there? So that's why that arc looks that. Okay. They want me to calculate how far from the base of the cliff the person's going to hit the water. That's my horizontal distance. And we know that horizontally, their velocity is constant, which means this formula always applies to the horizontal part of a projectile's motion. It okay? doesn't matter what kind of projectile motion it is. Horizontally, the object's velocity doesn't change. So if I want to find d, what do I need? Time is the one thing that both the vertical and the horizontal part have in common. Can I find it with the vertical information? I can't. Okay? I've got D, I've got A, and I've got VI. This is where our acceleration stuff gets applied. Okay? What formula can I use here to help me get T? D 
equals VIT plus one half AT squared. You know that one I said you'll, you'll never have to use to calculate time? Except when VI is zero? I should have really said you're always going to use this one to calculate time in projectile motion because VI is zero. Okay, at least in the horizon, in these horizontal ones. Okay, so that's zero. I can calculate time pretty easily here. I just have to do a little manipulating. So if I bring the half of A over and square root, okay, I'll be left with this. Now, since the 80 and the 9.1 are both down, I'm not going to make anything positive or negative here. Makes my life a little bit easier. Since there's only one direction and it's down, I don't have to worry about positive and negative. If it's launched at an angle, then there's some positive and negative I have to take into account. So in this situation for the vertical part, wouldn't VF also be zero? That's what a lot of people want to say. And you're right if I take into account after they hit the water. But we're only talking about this because they're only a projectile until they hit the water. So we're saying VF is the instant they strike the water, not after. Because after they start to slow down, you're absolutely right, their final velocity would be zero eventually because they would go down into the water. If this was a hard surface, it would be worse. Okay. Okay. All right, so we've got 80 divided by 1 half times 9.81. Now I could make those both negative, it'll still work out fine, but I don't need to in this situation. All right, so we've got um, the square root of 80 divided by um, 0.5 times 9.81. Okay, so this object is falling for just over four seconds. Should I keep all those decimals? Yes, I should. And I'm going to carry them over here. Because time is the one thing that these two parts share. And now I can calculate how far the object will travel horizontally. In other words, how far from the base of the cliff the person will hit the water. Okay, so V times T, 15 times uh, 4.03, whatever. It's going to be just over 60. 60.5, I think we only have two significant digits in that question, so uh, we'll say 61, 61 meters. That's a long way to swim back, but at least it'll, it'll, the, the waves will help you. All right, is that sort of making sense how something like that would work? There's, there's no new math involved here. Okay. You've got V equals D over T, you've got your acceleration formulas that we learned the other day. Okay. So there's nothing new, it's just a different application of it. And you actually have to do both at the same time as opposed to two separate problems. It is kind of two separate problems. Okay. All right, so that's one way a question like this might get phrased. It might say, the person runs horizontally off a cliff, and how far from the base of the cliff do they land? Okay. Another way that might go. So this car drives off the cliff at 35 meters per second. It uh, hits the ground, um, let's say mm, 67 meters from the base of the cliff. set of givens, right? So you're going to have to do basically the same things, but in a different order. Here's the thing. In every projectile motion problem, 
the most important number is time. You're almost never going to be given it, but you always have to have it. So at some point, you've got to calculate time because it's the one thing that can be used for both the horizontal and the vertical parts. So it's the most important piece of information. Okay, give me a few minutes, see if you can figure that one out. Okay, so on this one, here's our givens. Okay. As we said, we always want to break this up into the horizontal part and the vertical part. Okay. Vertically, they want me to find the displacement, how far they fall. Okay. That's how high the cliff is, is how, high they, is how far they fall. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, I do know that my initial vertical velocity is zero because we said they drive horizontally off the cliff. And I know the acceleration is 9.81 meters per second squared down. Okay, those are my pieces of information vertically. I don't know anything else. Horizontally speaking, I know the speed, 35 meters per second, and I know the distance, 67 meters. What can I find with that? Fine. Yeah. Remember, V equals D over T is the only formula that you're going to use with the horizontal information because it's traveling at a constant velocity horizontally. So I can calculate T by going D over V, 67 over 35. Okay, so this thing is going to be falling for 1.91 seconds, which is the one piece of information I can apply over here. Okay, can I find my vertical displacement now? Yeah, which formula am I going to use? Mm -hmm. You'll find this one gets used a lot with horizontally projected projectiles. Okay, so I know VI is zero, so if this whole thing is zero, I can just take it right out, and I'm going to go one half times 9.81. I'm not going to make it negative because it only moves downwards, so that part's not important. Okay, um, and then 1.91 squared. Okay, so I'm keeping all the decimals there. All right, it's an 18 meter clip. Okay, everybody all right with that? Okay. On your unit exam, I would put a question just like that. Okay. Each, you'll get one of each kind. We haven't talked about the, the angle projectiles yet, and we won't today, okay. but there's the other type of projectile motion is the angled projectile. All right. There's one other way I could ask a horizontally projected projectile question. That would be like this. So they all start the same. Something goes horizontally off of a cliff or diving board, whatever. Okay. Okay, this object went off the cliff at an unknown velocity. It was horizontal, but we don't know what it is. And they drove horizontally off this cliff at an unknown horizontal velocity. The cliff is 58 meters tall, and the object lands 19 meters from the base of the cliff. Calculate how fast the car was traveling when it drove off. That would be the last way I could ask. All right, writing down our givens here. From a horizontal perspective, all I know is how far it goes. 19 meters. I'm trying to find the speed. If I'm going to get that, I need the time. 
So hopefully I have enough information vertically to get it, right? Vertically, VI is zero meters per second, okay? The distance is 58 meters. The acceleration is 9.81 meters per second squared. So it looks like I've got enough information to calculate time with my vertical information. Okay, so D equals VI times T plus one half AT squared. Okay, are these getting like pretty formulaic? Like it's basically always the same two formulas, right? It's just a matter of which order you do it in. All right, so I'm going to take that out. I'm going to solve for t. So t will be the square root of d over half of a, not 2, d over half of a. Okay, so that'll be 58 meters divided by 1 half times 9.81. Okay, so... Uh, we got 3.43, 3.44 seconds is our time for falling, which is going to go right there, because it's the one thing that they share. Okay, and now I can calculate V. V equals D over T, 19 over 3.44, so this thing wasn't moving all that fast. Five point five meters per second. So maybe some people pushed it. Yeah, it was off. Yeah. All right, is that making some sense? Yeah. Pretty straightforward. And it gets a little bit trickier when we start talking about um, projectiles that are launched at an angle, because then we actually have to find their vector components. We'll know the the uh, like. We'll know the projected velocity or the launched velocity, but that's the hypotenuse of the triangle. We would have to find the vertical component, or y, using trig. That would be our initial vertical velocity. And we would have to find the horizontal component with trig. That would be our horizontal constant velocity. Okay? It, they still work fundamentally the same. There's just that extra trigonometry step that comes into play uh, when you're dealing with those. Now, projectile motion is one of the places that we can be both incredibly impressed by something or tell that it's obviously wrong. Okay? This is something Hollywood used to do really, really well. And since the advent of CGI does very, very poorly. Okay? Back in the day, if you wanted to jump a car and get it on film, you literally jumped a car and filmed it. And the car was destroyed. Okay, and hopefully the driver was okay. okay. Because back in the day, stunt drivers had to do that. Okay, it wasn't even like good remote control technology. You actually had to put a human being in a car, you were going to jump. Okay, it was crazy. Um, now, well, you know, safety, safety's good. Okay, you, you don't want to sacrifice somebody or spend the money setting up and calculating and doing all the stuff for this incredible shot where you're jumping something over something else. Okay, you just go, eh. Give it to the computer guy. He'll make it look good. Okay? Except they don't always. Okay? Sometimes they really mess it up. And it's really obvious sometimes. And you can just tell. You don't have to know anything about physics to watch something and go, oh, that looks fake. Okay? We just have that gut reaction. We know what things look like when they're affected by gravity. And when they don't do what they're supposed to do, it's obvious. Okay? It's, uh, it's really strange if you watch, um, like, people on the moon, like footage of the moon landings, which are not fake. Okay? Just in case there are conspiracy theories. Right? Um, but if you watch the, the footage, like people are like, oh, the flag is waving and stuff like that. So you know what they can't fake? The way that people had to move. Okay? And the way they did move. You can't fake that on Earth. Okay? The fact that when they would step, they would actually like come off the ground a little bit because gravity was so much lower on the moon than it is here. Okay, how they came down the ladder okay, on, from, the, from the landing unit okay, and came down the ladder, how they didn't fall at the right rate. It wasn't that it was slowed down or whatever people say. Okay. Um, it's, it's the fact that there was one sixth, right, I said one third, it was one sixth of the gravity of Earth. So even in a big heavy space suit, okay, these, 
these guys were still considerably lighter than they would have felt at home. And one of the things they found was on the moon or in the moon's gravity, walking like we do on Earth or trying to walk quickly like we do on Earth was a recipe for disaster. Okay? Because there's always a bit of a vertical push when you walk. Everybody walks differently, but um, there's always a bit of a vertical push when you walk. And on the moon, that was enough to actually make them jump a little bit. Okay? So, you know, most of us when we walk, you know, our head stays pretty level, but it goes up and down a little bit. Some people, you know, they walk a little differently when their head goes up and down a little bit more. Okay? But on the moon, if you're walking, even that small amount of vertical movement was enough to push them off the ground. And there was a real worry from the people back on Earth that they could trip and fall. Now, it's not that tripping and falling is a big deal. It's not like you're going to break your arm in one-sixth gravity, but you could break your faceplate. Okay? If you fall, you don't get your hands out, or you fall awkwardly, and you rupture or tear any part of the suit, you'll die. Okay? Because all of the air will blast out, and the pressure will be gone, and you'll pop. Yeah. So they were really worried about that. So they wanted them to find safer ways to move in the lower gravity. They didn't want them to follow a projectile arc while they were walking. Okay? So they actually did this lunar shuffle. Okay? And if you watch them on the moon, they do this a lot when they're walking on the moon. And they shuffle along. They push horizontally a lot more than you would on Earth. It's much ridiculous on Earth. Okay? But in one-sixth gravity, it's a really effective way to move. And it pushes objects out of the way and keeps you from moving vertically. So with that point that conspiracy theorists bring up that the flag was Mm -hmm. Why does it wave? There's any number of explanations from changed camera angles to vibrations. Okay, um, you know when they would get out and move around, okay, move stuff around the flag. Like there's all kinds of explanations for it, not involving having any wind or any current, okay, um, causing it to move. Okay. Like the people, like people say, oh, you can even see it moving in this. View. Like you never actually see it moving unless somebody's like physically. Plus, the moon is, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that can happen vibration-wise on the surface. It's not like it was planted deep in the ground or anything. Um, all right, so everybody kind of good with that? I got a few projectile videos I'm going to show you. Not projectile vomiting, because that's gross. Okay, I'll show you that, but yeah, some other ones here. Wait, don't you 